be the first speaker. The the first speaker of the of the week. Uh, it seems really amazing conference and thanks to the organizer in advance. Okay, so today I'd like to talk about the combinatorial quantization of Hamiltonian transignment theory with the super gauge group GL11. So my point is tell you what is the title mean. So before starting to explain about the title, I want to start with the topic of the conference and say how the title can have connection with the title. We have higher structure in QFT and a string theory. So there are two words of QFT. Oops. Okay, it was not working. Okay, can you see that now? Yes. Okay, good. So we have the two word of QFT and a string theory in a title. So if you start from the quantum field theory that I guess everybody in, in uh, this conference knows uh, about that, we can have some type of um, particular type of QFT that calls topological quantum field uh, theory and we, this particular type, we are able to calculate the topological invariance. And um, uh, another, and this TQFT, they have different um, uh, type in different dimension. And the particular type of the TQFT that we can consider is that, sorry, I don't know why what's happening to my slide and it doesn't change. Okay, is three dimensional TQFD that gives the connection to the quantization of transignment theory. So the transignment theory indeed is the best, uh, I mean, the best understood uh, type two dimensional TQFD and they have connection with the, they, I mean, they obtain through that Rechetikin tour of construction or via the tour of Vero construction. I'm not planning to explain to those. I'm just mentioning these keywords if there is any connection with your, uh, with your research topic. So, you know, where is the bigger picture look like? So, and if we go from the side of a string theory, we know that the string theory is one of the more promising model in the quantum gravity. And three-dimensional gravity is actually has a connection with the chart Simon. And in the original articles on three-dimensional gravity, it was a discussion as a formulation of the chart Simon theory and also discovering its the holographic relation to the two-dimensional conformal field theory, like the, for example, like ADS-CFT connection that exists in a string theory, something like that exists between the churn simon theory that is like two-dimensional gravity and two-dimensional CFT as a boundary of that. So this is another type of relation that this topic can have with, 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 um, with CFT and from the quantum gravity point of view. So let me start with uh, the conference. I plan to talk about the combinatorial condensation. I plan to tell you what is that. And very briefly at the end, I hopefully find the time to tell you about the, how we can generalize this approach, the super group and particularly for group J11. So, let me start with the explanation about the combinatorial quantization. So uh, before I explain what is this combinatorial quantization uh, really look like, I'd like to give a short introduction about the Chern Simon theory so we can all be in the same page. So Chern Simon theory is a three-dimensional field theory and when uh, the Chern-Simon theory on the manifold M with the gauge group G, 
classically can be defined having the following accent. I think you don't see my mouse because I cannot move it, unfortunately. And um, there is a M is a three dimensional manifold, and there is a integer, positive integer parameter like called K that we call it level, usually the Simon's theory. And we have the uh, one form. Uh, mm, uh, like gauge field A, that um, yeah, that is that takes its value in some like compact and semi simple Lie algebra G for the moment. And the generator, the generator of T A from basis is in 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 the group G and satisfy the commutation relation written here. So the um, a very nice observation of written in 1989, it showed how the quantum field theory that is having the chern simon accent with a compact and semi-simple gauge group can produce some important invariance in topology. And this observation was one of the starting point to let the physicists and the mathematician be, uh, talk to each other and quantum field theory from the physics point of view uh, become also connected to the invariance of three manifold in, in topology. And in particular, we can show that for the gauge group SU2, and he shows that is a relation of that with the Jones polynomials in the uh, in, in, in topology. So, um, and today, what I like to do that I like to concentrate on a very particular version of this chern simon theory that it has the call Hamiltonian interpretation. I will explain next slide what is that. And to perform this Hamiltonian quantization, one needs to choose a manifold that admits a local time-like foliation. It means that we can choose a direction that time flows. So let's see what is exactly mean. It means that we can suppose that the manifold M that we choose is to look like a cylinder. So it's like two dimensional manifold stigma times R. And one can split the connection of A as it was in the action of the term Simon that can be split in between the times and, and space part. And we choose a direction that is parallel to this R that our manifold has to be at like the time direction and the two space like component of the gauge field, like fat A become like dynamical variables. And yeah, and we have this, this, um, uh, this fat A uh, the, as, as a denote by A, the two component gauge field on a surface sigma. In, in the cylinder sigma times r that we defined. So after we change these variables, the action of the chair Simon look like as follows. And our manifold here we consider like two dimensional manifold sigma times like the, like the for example, line between zero and, and, and one. Uh, so, Okay, now we have our action. The first term in the action determines the Poisson brackets of the dynamical variables. And in particular, the Poisson brackets of the constraints F that we say F of this fat A is, is derivative of A plus A squared or A which A is zero. And this is actually the, 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 the flatness condition that we have. And uh, okay, we can calculate this, the, the Poisson bracket between um, of this constraint F that we have. And we can also, one can expect the constraint that generates the gauge transformation of, of A. And having these ingredients, we can get that the phase space of the Hamiltonian chern simon theory is a quotient of the a space of the flat connection over the gauge group. So we have our modular space of 
flat connection M that has the flat connection and all that we have on these two manifold sigma that we have modulo all the gauge transformation that is easily comes from this uh, form of the churn Simon that we call the Hamiltonian form. Okay, so now we, we are interested about the quantization. Uh, we see that the modular space of light connection appears to be the phase space of the churn Simon theory on the cylinder. And the action that I showed in the last page provides the canonical Poisson bracket on the modular spaces. So when we have this Poisson bracket on the modular space for, for this fat A that now we are interested from now on, um, and uh, then we have the Poisson bracket, and then we can we can use our usual standard way of changing Poisson bracket to the to the commutator relation, and we do the uh, do the quantization. Okay, but there is also exists another way of quantizing, and this is by using the observable of the theory, and this is good because when we had just our Poisson manifold in a, in a Poisson bracket in the manifold, it was based on, depends on, on the connection of a smooth manifold. So we could have, so like infinite in number of those. But then if we want to have the finite number of the um, variables, we can use the observable of the theory that in this case are given by the Wilson lines that are defined along the like the path that are non-contractible path, like we call it P here, over on in this two-dimensional manifold sigma. And the Wilson lines actually are equivalent to each other if their paths are homotopically equivalent. And this is actually coming from the topological nature of the theory. We already mentioned that our Charles Simon theory is, is topologically has a topological nature and by changing the little bit of the path, for example, if the topology of the surface doesn't change, so there is a result will not be changed. Unless, for example, if the Wilson lines, if they cross each other, if the, the topological shape change, of course it would be changed, but the little like change, a slightly um, change of the path, it will not change the result. And Having this, this observable, one can reconstruct the space of function and the phase space with its Poisson bracket from the Wilson lines. So now we can have now the new type of version of the Poisson bracket that can be constructed through these Wilson lines. Okay, so having these tools in hand, now I can go to the main goal of the talk actually, and is the combinatorial quantization strategy. So we replace the sigma, the two manifold, by a ribbon graphs that is encoded with the first homotopic group of the sigma. And it means that we have some ribbon graph that is made of some lines, some like edges and some vertex. vertex. The second step is we can consider in the following algebra UP for, for the path P. And yeah, so this is the, um, uh, yeah, so this is the exponential form of the, of the integral. And um, in principle, we don't really care now about this fat A anymore because we just, what we, just need is the Poisson structure of that because if we can, if we can have the Poisson structure of that, we can have our quantization. And now we have this, this. I mean, if we can have the Poisson structure of this A, we can see what is the like the relation between the UP for different for different paths. So it's bring me to the third point in in this page that the. Mm. Yes, this is exactly what I explained already. That, that the that the that the result in the set of the quadratic equation, um, quadratic equation type, sorry, for the for the quantum algebra, the UP is is 
just come directly from the past and the structure of, of the A. So, okay, having that um, vector space, we can impose two types of conditions. The first one, we can impose the gauge invariance condition on the, on the vertices of the ribbon graph. And from that, I mean, if we have, for example, two the vertex of the ending of the pad P, we can bring it close to each other and make the trace. So this is the gauge inverse condition. And the second one is the flatness. It means when we have the holonomy along the contractible paths, and this should be trivial. So this is the second uh, this uh, constraint that we put. And when we have this thing, this um, uh, condition added, then this the strategy would be like uh, like this criticizing, I mean, making the lattice in the lattice gauge theory when we have the, like the discrete lattice gauge theory. But the difference is in the lattice gauge theory, usually people are not getting the exact result. But here in, in the churn Simon theory, if we use this approach, we can actually get really the exact because our, our, our theory in this case is topological. So actually at the end, our result is not depends on the topology and we don't lose any data. So this is perfectly fine and it's very nice and, and approachable because we have like very simple combinatorial uh, algebra to deal with. Okay. And so what is the result that we can get? That the theory recast into a form that is finite dimensional. So this is very good. Um, the algebra that we get will give us the quantum version of the modular space of flat connection M. So this is what we are looking for that in the quantization of sharon Simon. Uh, the algebra of operator we realize on the Hilbert space. So for having the quantum system, we usually need two things, the algebra function and Hilbert space. So we can have both. And the symmetry of the group uh, acts on the mapping class group. So we can obtain the project representation of the mapping class group on, 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 on two dimensional manifold sigma. And if we have mapping class group representation, for example, one of the like a straightforward thing that we can immediately calculate is the invariant of three manifold. And so, yeah, so these are the, the benefit of that. And here I just focus on a concrete example that is Toros. And then it means our churn Simon theory would be like uh, T2 times, uh, uh, times um, line. So this is the simple churn Simon that we want to focus. And if we can understand this one, it would be easy to generalize it to the more complicated surfaces. Okay, so I told you actually the main stuff that I want to given a, a present in the talk and I will go to the details as much time as I have. But before that, I was thinking maybe it's good to also put topic of this Hamiltonian quantization in a little bit bigger picture. Maybe it would be nice that, that we can talk about that and discuss in our gather time discussion. And I want to present that we have in general two different approach of quantizing trans Simon theory from perturbative and non-perturbative. And I just list the lots of keywords. I'm sorry if I'm not very um, precise about that, but just put you this keyword, but because I feel that most of people in this conference have connection with at least one of these topic. So, and I just list the name of the people like Constantine that is the next speaker that they talk about this perturbative quantum chain Simon theory. And I'm myself very, um, uh, would be very interested to discuss with people how each of these topics can be connected with each other. So, but we know where the Hamiltonian quantization at least sits in the very big picture. So 
And the other topics that may, maybe they are not exactly here, but they have really nice connection with is the two dimensional CFD, like WZW, logarithmic and non logarithmic CFD, topological string, and topological recursion. That there are topics of the other speakers of the conference. So let me go now to some more details. For understanding this churn Simon theory on this particular example that we want, the main tools that we need is the Hopf algebra. So this is the main key for understanding all of them. So I like to have a little crash course on, um, on Hopf algebra. And I'm sorry if you already uh, know about this uh, stuff. Uh, so let us start with a very basic definition of algebra and the co-algebra. So we can consider a field K uh, and A as a vector space. The unital associative algebra is a triple like made from like from like vector space A and two um, other map that is called multiplication map M that is A tensor A mapping to A and unital map that is showed by eta that bring the field K to vector space A. And they satisfy some axioms. So don't, don't um, worry if, I mean, it does satisfy some axioms. It's okay. So we can also uh, define co-associative co-algebra that he is like the triple now with a and two other different map that are like the like co-map of the previous one so in this time we have like co-multiplicative that is a goes to a tensor a and we have co-unital map that go from a to k that they also satisfy some axioms so the if we have a bi-algebra so then it means that is an algebra that that has these properties of algebra and um, like in previous one algebra and co-algebra together. So it's called bi-algebra, and are compatible with each other again with some axioms. So now having that, we can go to the one a step more and we can define a Hopf algebra. Hopf algebra is a bi-algebra that we can have one extra map that is called antipode that we denoted here with S, that is go from A to A. And there is another condition that should be satisfied that we can call a bi-algebra, Hopf algebra, and it's written here. So I just like very, very uh, like fake, fake. I, I want to just show the few of these axiom that they look like very complicated comparing that with the properties that we have in group. So we can see that are not actually complicated. So they're just translation of the consistency condition that we have in groups. They exist now in, in, in Hopf algebra language. So just for you to just see how this co-associated co-unity unity and the last condition of the Hopf algebra condition has very similar behavior with, with, with consistency condition in normal groups. So going back to our Hopf algebra definition, I like to give you one example that are actually one of the very like important class of the example of the UQG algebra, which are the one parameter deformation of the ordinary Lie algebra that we know. And they usually, when we, they, we send Q to one, they go to the normal algebra that we have. So here our algebra is Q, UQSL2, that with Q going to one, it gives us our normal SL2. So it has the three generator, K, E, and F, that has the following relations. And they have like co-product, co-unit, and antipode, as I already defined in a previous slide. This is the relation that they set, they, they, have and of course all the axioms that I mentioned they already satisfies. So 
now I want to define particular type of Hopt algebra that is called quasi-triangular Hopt algebra. And we call a Hopt algebra is quasi-triangular if there exists the element that is called universal element R as follows. And these are satisfied the following three relation on the left. I'm sorry that I don't, I mean, I cannot point it with the, with the, with the mouse now. And yes, and another relation that this R satisfy is the relation at the bottom of the page that they call Young-Baxter equation. And this is actually one of the very main relation in the integrability. So if you, are, if you work in integrability, this is the way that we can connect our research to each other. So now after having this R defined, so I like to show you how this young Baxter equation can be shown through the picture. And so this is very easy way that you can remember this relation. So if it can have like line one, two, and three, so the left relation is the way that the left picture is can be imagined. And this is, is just tell us it's like that we bring the line two passing through the, 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 the cross point of the line one and three to the right. And this is how the relation can be shown in the picture. So I also like to very briefly just let you know that this very beautiful Young-Baxter equation relation, if we start from the left-hand side and we, we use the three axioms of the quasi-triangularity, this tree that is written on the, on the left, if we, if we use this relation, we can get the right hand side. So the algebraic proof of that is also very straightforward. So I like also to define another type of whole algebra that is very important for the combinatorial quantization technique that is called ribbon hop algebra. So uh, from the R matrix that we defined, one can construct a monodromy matrix M that is called like the matrix R21, and then R12, it means when the two legs that are just twisting. And if you remember, R was defining on the like when we have two Hopf algebra tensor to each other. And the Hopf algebra is called ribbon if there exists a central element V as an element of. Hopf algebra H that such that this this following relation satisfy, and there are two more things that I like to just define. So there exists and some linear function which called right integral, and there exists the co-integral that is the that is uh, commuting with the element of element of um, Hopf algebra and also it produces itself, to, I mean, with having like unit, uh, co unit epsilon x involved. And these two relations that I show you, they are important in the combinatorial quantization when we want to. Um, when we want to use the two constraints that I mentioned, this gauge invariant constraint and, and flatness con uh, con condition. These two are the algebraic tools that I need when I want to insert those two conditions. Another cool thing that I like to also mention that if we have the Hopf algebra, we can make some type of double. It means we have Hopf algebra H and I can have another copy of H Let's call it the star is, is the dual of that uh, of algebra indeed. And I can construct some type of algebra they call Dreamfeld double. And these are matrix that we define that the satisfying Young Baxter equation is the canonical element of this, this double. But from this Hopf algebra, we can also construct another type of double that is called Heisenberg double, that it has its own canonical element that calls um, T, and this T satisfy another type of relation that calls pentagon relation. 
And the pentagon relation, like the, like from the pictorial way, the same way that we had young backs on the left, the pictorial way on the right is like two three partner move. That if we have two two, two, two oh my god, the tetrahedral glue to each other, we can also divide it in in three pieces. And this is also the two three partner move also appear in the invariance of the three manifold. I will not use this Heisenberg double in the rest of the talk, but just wanted to give you some nice overview about that. So now I want to go back like to the beginning and tell you some motivation why this combinatorial quantization is, is, is nice. Uh, the, first of all, the combinatorial Hamiltonian quantization for the first time for the semi simple gauge group was, not, uh, was uh, discovered by Alexiev, Gross, and Somerus. And the two main thing that people uh, got from that approach is first they got the quantization of the modular space of flat connection on the surface and it's, there's also connection of the Kataev model that is very famous model in the condensed matter theory and if we have for example Kataev model of, for the Hopf algebra H we can find a combinatorial quantization for the dreamfold double of this H and there is also a relation with the representation of this uh, Heisenberg, uh, this whole algebra, sorry, uh, through the two RF zero or the representation of the dream fold double of this uh, Hopf algebra to restrict it into RF. And for under, if you like to understand this picture better in details, you can look at the works of Katarina Mosberger. She had several papers and talks exactly explaining this this picture and actually I got the idea of this picture from one of her uh, talks. So let me continue to the benefits of the combinatorial quantization. So the very nice another point that I already mentioned I'm just repeating that it gives us a systematic and constructive method of quantization and is until now it's developed through for the same simple and ordinary group, Lie group. But what one can do, and this is actually what we did, we generalize that for the non semi simple and for the super gauge group. And uh, when we construct those, what we can get as a, as a, a word, we can get calculate a, a new type of ma uh, manifold invariance, and you can estimate the logarithmic safety that in the previous wor work, it was just has a relation with non-logarithmic safety. And this is our first paper that in our first paper, we just focus on the case when we have a, we had a torus. So if I want to tell you what is the details of that on, on, a, on a torus? We can look at the, um, the first homotopic group of the torus. I think everybody knows how it looks like. We can have two loops like A and B, and these A and B have the relation they, that the, if I start from the, from the loop B and like go through A inverse, B inverse and A, it give me some trivial um, parameter uh, E. And uh, here for this, from now on in this example T, I have the, my whole algebra is, is denoted by, by G in this, this example. So, Mm, we associate the A and B cycle to some quantum elements A and B, this capital A and capital B. And what we try to understand, we try to understand the relations that this A and B, they satisfy. So this A and B, the, the space that we define them, they're actually in like Hopf algebra G, tensor 
tau. And this tau is actually called Handel algebra. It's a particular type of algebra that it's defined itself as a space that are some relation exists between A and B, and it's defined as a like some space to help us to make this quantization of the classical phase space M that we had. Um, okay, I just don't go more to the details and I just go to the next step. And this handle algebra, this is actually a algebra that we need to use the quotient of our gauge invariance and flat condition that it give us the algebra of observable. So this handle algebra is actually the space that we need to focus on that. So that's why I just want to show you how the set of exchange relations between these A and B, capital A and capital B, that there are con like the, how did I, like the, oops. Like the, like the quantum elements of the cycle A and B have some relations. And this is how it looks like. So if you look at the first two relations, you see that there are just the relation that exists between A's with each other or Bs with each other. And the third one is the exchange relation that introduced the non-trivial computation relation because the first one are just trivial relation that are trivial when we are in the torus and we just have one uh, loop A and one loop B. But when we go to the more complicated space that are not that trivial. And the Handel algebra tau, as you see here, is is um, algebra that has all of these these three series of um, equation. So then, the, as I mentioned, there are two more conditions that we need to you know, we need to consider. This is gauge invariance. Actually, I don't have time to go to the details, but I just want to tell you there's a lot of Hopf algebra technique that one can use and prove that the gauge invariance, to satisfy the gauge invariance, we need to satisfy some algebraic relation between Hoft algebra. I'm not going through that. And then the second condition was the flatness condition. Just very briefly, I'm just telling you that in a normal case, the flatness condition, it means that the when we have like the condition for the flat means when we have a loop, we can contract it. It can, it can, we can make a circle to the point. And it looks like, okay, when we are in the quantum version, it's like all of the A and B cycles, they just become like capital A and B, like the quantum equivalence of that relation. But actually this is not the case. And if we want to have some, Triviality on the right hand side between the right hand side when we have like B A inverse B inverse A from the Hopf algebra properties again that has come from ribbon element ribbon Hopf algebra. Uh, there is another set of relation that they should be satisfied. So this is the monodromy that has some relation between with, with, with ribbon element V operator B and operator A and their inverse. So just for you to have some feeling how these things look like. And then I also want to show, tell you that also for the mapping class group that is has relation with the normal circle uh, cycle A and B in the classical case, one can also get that through like the quantum capital A and capital B. And as you see here, this V hat and V hat B, there are the, there are the um, operator actually that e exist in the, in the um, 
in the new system that we get that is depends on the mu and v that I defined in the Hopped algebra uh, part of the talk and quantum algebra A and quantum algebra B. So you see here, actually, the when we want to really get the operator, we had A and we had B, that are for circle, cycle A and B, they're very complicated. But the nice thing is they are satisfied the projective SL2 relation. So this is very nice and so that we are in a good path. And when we have this mapping class group representation, like now the, like the operator version, the Hilbert space also, adding to that, now having the mapping class group quantum version, now we can construct the new type of not or manifold invariant. And we can also gener generalize that to the uh, higher genus. So it's become more complicated. We have like G times of like um, algebra, algebra A and B, and we still can calculate like, like the monodromy and we can more much more difficult, but we can insert gauge invariance and flatness condition. And consequently we can get the algebra of um, um, algebra over of the um, over the modular space of flat connection. So, just in the last five minutes, I will also tell you how about our work actually and how we generalize that to the non well supergroup. So, we started with group GL11 as a first supergroup because it's the simplest group that we could start with. And this group actually have, uh, this group has four generator like K alpha, K beta, E plus and E minus that E plus and E minus are the odd variables. And they have this relation as you see between them and they have the, and there are like, I just wrote as an example, just the co-product relation of the K alpha, K beta, E plus and E minus and they are graded of course. So because they are in the super case, so the tensor product also see some, some Grassmannian variables in the algebra. So it's become also again difficult because of the extra sign that is coming from the grading of the algebra. And what we can do for this GL11, we can construct the Handel algebra, we can insert gauge invariance and flatness condition. We can find the algebra function. We can find the mapping class group representation and we can find the invariance of the tree manifold. And here I just show you that we also got like this um, SL2 uh, Z relation, this S and T, this curly S and T are I just copied this one from our paper that there are the, um, the, the, the operators in when we use the combinatorial quantization approach for the super gauge group gel one one. And we saw that the mapping class group representation that we get agrees with the following noun result through the string theory brain construction. Mikhailov had some result that we could so I agree with what he, he had, but ours is in a way more constructive because he just have it for the uh, for the case without any um, for just for the, without any um, for genus zero, and we can do it for higher genus. We also saw from the representation point of view, we saw that there is a work of Lobachenko Majid about the SL2 action of the UK gl one one, and we saw this. Curly S and T satisfy this, this SL2 relation, and it was matching with the non result of uh, these people to, from the representation point theory, very pure representation theory point of view. And we also show that the, like the S and T transformation from the GL11WZW model, that is the two dimensional CFT type, and they have the S and T transformation that is a typical transformation people have in CFT through the work of Salou and Sumeros. We saw also we can find some 
relation between R, like curly S and curly T with this S and, and T. So there is a, a dictionary between um, those as well. And so it's bring me to the conclusion. So we just show that the combinatorial Hamiltonian quantization of churn Simon theory provides an algebraic construction for this quantum churn Simon. So it's purely algebraic. So we have fully control if we know all the hoped algebra language behind that. Here, I just show very quickly about our simple example of Toros but it can be extended to any two dimensional surface and to more complicated gauge group that are non-semi-simple because this brings some difficulty in the flatness condition that we had this when it's not semi-simple anymore. And we can also generalize it to the super gauge group. That is means that it brings some grading to the story. And we also, uh, allows the construction of the new type of knot and, man and knot and manifold invariants that uh, this knot and manifold invariants they were not calculated some of them are matched with what is known before but some of them are not calculated because people were not able to go to the higher genus case but now with this very combinatorial and constructive way that we have we can find a new type of uh, knot and manifold invariance for more complicated case. And it also has a connection with the logarithmic uh, CFD and in principle with condensed matter theory because we use, we use this lattice like discretization uh, form. And yeah, so it's bring me to the end of my talk and thank you so much for your listening. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. Um, so if you have questions, then um, you might raise your hand on Zoom. So I can ask you to unmute and then you can ask. Sorry, I just stopped to share because I can see your faces then. Uh -huh, yeah, but maybe there are some questions. Yeah, right? then I go back the, because it's a very com I, I couldn't have Zoom and the slides in the same time. Okay. Um, all right, so we have a question from Ondra Hulik. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Oh, um, yes. Hi, cool, okay. I, I have a question about the um, uh, the not invariance. If you, uh, um, so if you pass to super groups, uh, mm -hmm. does that give you some, you know, like, can you differentiate some of the knots which weren't previously differentiated by, by the, you know, well-known um, not invariants, like like is is getting into supergroups buying you some new refinement to 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 the usual story, or is it just giving you, I don't know, um, just just different types of not invariants, but but same like um, power in in terms of differentiating the knots uh, among among themselves. Uh, yeah, actually, in principle, yes, because we have all the tools, and the only thing that we need to construct that are the rep mapping classical representation that we have those, so someone can construct it. Although it's very difficult because there are all of these extra Grassmannian generators and stuff that we you, mm -hmm. we get is real make the story very difficult. We just calculate very simple type of. Uh, uh, invariant, and there is the work of this Salur um, Sumeros that I mentioned that they calculated from the W, the W for GL11, they calculated through the CFT approach, and we got the same result for the first example. And when we also have some proposal for the new invariants that is actually coming in the second paper that is not published yet. But uh, I mean, it's not even archive. And yes, in principle, we, our, our claim is we can give you the tools that someone can calculate the invariant of the three manifold for the super gauge group. Mm -hmm. And this one is already for just GL11 and for higher rank can be done, but 
first someone should do all of the procedures that we did now for GL11 and get the representation of in class group first. And after that, yes, you can, you can get it. But the good point here is it's doable to do. At least the tools are there. It's very difficult to put all of them over each other and really make a number at the invariant, but it's uh -huh. doable. And I think it's maybe it's need some computer programming or just a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, techniques. But yes, this is this is this is our, our our claim actually that we have new series of invariants that is also bad in a sense that because we don't have any previous result to check with them, you know. Right. But but we are sure that our way is so constructive and precise that what we get is really true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then there is um, a question from Friedrich. Um, hi, uh, I want to ask, uh, is there a simple reason why the, this- I cannot the... hear you, Friedrich. I think you're talking, but- Oh, I can... oh okay, um, sorry. Uh... I, I could hear him, you cannot. Ah. So you can hear me? I can hear you, yes. Hmm. I think it's my problem then. Donnie, can you hear me? Yes. We can, I think everyone can hear you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was not an important question anyway. I mean, can, can you hear him when he talks now? Uh, no, we have to we have to unmute her. No, no, no. I mean, if he um, if she can hear if Friedrich talks now. I can hear him now. Yes. Okay. okay. Go on. Uh, yeah, I, ju I just wanted to ask: like, is there a simple reason why this story leads to a logarithmic CFT and instead of just a normal one? Uh, in this case, because GL11 is a non-semi simple. Group. So that is the reason. Okay, so in general, non semi simple groups would lead to, to logarithmic. Yes. Okay, yes. okay, okay. Yes. got it. Thanks. And just mentioning for the super, I mean, for the non semi simple group, because nobody never did it for non semi simple, starting from super group is easier than the non susy, non, -su non susy, non semi simple. I mean, if you want to do non semi simple, it's easier to start with supergroup because there are some relation that they are become zero because of because of the grading or because of this actually this Grassmannian properties that they have. Mm -hmm. So it's it's when you are in the non semi simple, it's easier if you start with the super. That's why we start with GL11 because it was mm -hmm. easy. Thank you. Okay, so there is another question from Donny, please. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot, first of all, for the talk. It was very, very interesting. And um, my, my question is a bit about this, this two extra data you had on the Hopf algebra. I think it was this, this integral map and the uh, central element V, you called it. And um, how, how, uh, how you say, general are these these things like do you have some kind of modelized space of them or is like for any given Hopf algebra you have them or is this like constraining kind of because it seems that they're very important for this mono monodromy relation you need to impose oh sorry i i, I cannot hear you yes yes exactly they are very important for for getting this monodromy relation and consequently getting the flatness condition. Um, if your question is, if we can all, for any given host algebra, we can have a ribbon element. I think the answer is, I'm not sure. I guess, like, let me, 
look at this slide that I had. Um, okay, I prefer to not say anything. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember now that it was any difficulty for at least for our hoped our hoped algebra to get the ribbon element and any of the axioms related to that but i prefer to not say anything mm -hmm. but i guess yes i guess 90 percent for any given half algebra can have the um, ribbon half algebra as well mm -hmm. okay but 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 i i prefer to not be, say 100 percent because sure. yeah of yeah. course of course yeah but there are works of libachenkov that he has a book and if you like to learn about these things it's a lot is is written in his books and his papers okay cool thanks